Hi everyone, welcome back to Pages of the Globe. Today I'm going to be reading to you the short story called Pancakes by Joanne Bauer. Now Pancakes is a short story that tells a story of a teenage girl named Jill. Now Jill has been told by many people including her mother and ex-boyfriend that she is a perfectionist. And she thinks this is wrong until one morning at work she works an unusually busy shift by herself. And it's very stressful for her, and she basically turns into a frenzy. So, in the beginning, we get to see how Jill thinks that she isn't really that much of a perfectionist. And as we see her go on about her day, we see that the reason she thinks she is somewhat of a perfectionist is because it helps her keep her grounded to her roots. So the theme in this story is that no matter how organized you can be, you will never know what is going to happen. You never know what life will bring you to. And in this story, we get to see Jill kind of realize that. So I don't want to spoil too much about the story. So I'm going to tell you a couple facts about the author, Joanne Bauer. Now, Joanne Bauer was born on July 12th, 1951. She is the New York Times best-selling author, screenwriter, songwriter, and speaker. The main characters in her books are typically teenagers who are dealing with complicated family issues such as alcoholism, abandonment, illness, and self-esteem issues. She's received multiple awards and recognition for her work, including the Newbery Honor Medal, and the Times, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Joan Bauer has made her writing debut with the book Squashed, which earned many positive reviews. She's also written many books, including Hope Was There, Rules of the Road, and Almost Home. These are three of her probably most famous books. Now, Pancakes itself, the short story, appeared in a book called Trapped. Pages of the Mind and Body. It was published in 1998 and had many authors such as Rita Williams Garcia, Apollo, and it was about a lot of people who, like Jill, had some kind of issue. In Jill's case, it was the fact that she felt the need to keep everything perfect around her. Now, I don't want to get too much into the story and reveal the true plot, so let's get started. Remember to like, subscribe, and leave a comment below what you would like to read next. Pancakes by Joanne Bauer The last thing I wanted to see taped to my bathroom mirror at 5.30 in the morning was a newspaper article entitled, Are You a Perfectionist? But there it was, courtesy of my mother, Miss Subtlety herself. I was instantly irritated because Alan Feynman had accused me of perfectionism when he broke up with me last month. The term he used was rabid perfectionism, which I felt was a bit much, but then Alan Feynman had no grip on reality whatsoever. He was rabidly unaware, if the truth be known, like a benign space creature visiting Earth with no interest in going native. I tore the article off the mirror. This left tape smudges. Dirty mirrors drove me crazy. I grabbed the bottle of Windex from the closet and cleaned the gook off until the mirror shined, freed of yellow journalism. I glowered at the six telltale perfectionist signs in the now crumpled article. Number one, do you have a driving need to control your environment? Number two, you have a driving need to control the environment of others. Number three, are you miserable when things are out of place? Number four, are your expectations of yourself and others rarely met? Number five, do you believe if something is to be done right, only you are the one to do it? Number six, do you often worry about your performance when it is less than perfect? Number six had a particular sting, for it was that very thing Alan Feynman had accused me of the day he asked for his green and black lumberjack shirt back.
a truly spectacular shirt that looked a lot more spectacular on me than it did on him because it brought out the intensity of my short black hair and my mysterious brown eyes. He accused me of numbers one through five as well, but on this last fateful day he said, You see, the problem with you, Jill, is that if the least little thing goes wrong, you can't handle it. Everything else has to follow this impossible path to perfection. Some day, and I hope it's soon for your sake, you're going to have to settle for a subpar performance and realize that you're imperfect like the rest of us. He stormed off like an angry prophet who had just delivered a curse, muttering that if I was like this at seventeen, imagine what I would be like at thirty. Good riddance, I shouted. I hope you find a messy, inconsiderate girlfriend who can never find her purse or her car keys, who has no sense of time, no aptitude for planning, and that you spend the rest of your excellent years on your hands and knees looking for your contacts. I padded down the hall to my bedroom. It was Sunday morning. I was due at my waitress job at the Yield Pancake House in 45 minutes. I sat on my white down quilt, saw the chocolate smudge, quickly got up and brushed the smudge with my spot remover kit that I kept in my top dresser drawer, being careful to brush the nap against the grain. I put the kit back in my drawer, refluffed my two white pillows, picked a dead leaf off my philodendron plant, and remembered my second to last fight with Alan when he went completely ballistic at my selfless offer to alphabetize his CD collection with a color-coded cross-reference guide by subject, title, and artist. Males. I put on my yield pancake house waitress uniform that I had ironed and starched the night before. Blue, long-sleeved, ankle-length dress, white apron, white and blue flowered bonnet. I could have done without the bonnet, but when you're going for the ye old look, you have to sacrifice style. I was lucky to have this job. I got it one week after my parents and I moved to town, got hired because I am a person of order who knows there is a right way and a wrong way to do things. I replaced a waitress who is a completely disorganized slob as Howard O'Halloran, the owner of the Ye Old Pancake House, said to me, Jill, if you're half as organized and competent as you look, I will die happy. I smoothed my short clipped hair, flicked a sesame seed off my just manicured nail, and told him that I was. I have a system for everything, I assured him. Menu first, bring water when you come back to take the order, call it in, Bring coffee immediately to follow. Don't ever let customers wait. Then I mentioned my keen knack for alphabetizing condiments, which was always a bonus, particularly when things got busy, and how a restaurant storage closet should be properly organized to take full advantage of the space. You're hired, Howard O'Halloran said reverently, and put me in charge of the opening, setting up the restaurant on Saturday and Sunday mornings, which is when nine-tenths of all the pancakes in the entire universe are consumed, and you don't want some systemless person at the helm. You want a waitress with some grit, a strategic battle plan that never wavers. Sunday morning in a pancake house is war. I tied my white apron in a perfect bow across my back, tiptoed past my parents' bedroom, taking care not to wake them, even though my mother had taken an insensitive pot shot at me without provocation. It's not like my life had been all that perfect. Did I ask to be moved three times in the 18 months because my father kept getting transferred? Did I ask to attend three high schools since sophomore year? Did I complain about being unfairly uprooted? Well, I did complain a little. Didn't I figure out a way to handle the pressure? When my very roots were being yanked from familiar soil, I became orderly and organized. I did things in the new town so that people would like me and want to hire me, would want to be my friends. I baked world-class cookies, 
for high school bake sales, even if it meant staying up till 3 a.m. I joined clubs and volunteered for the grunge jobs that no one wanted. I always turned in a spectacular performance, and people counted on me to do it. I made everything look easy. People looked up to me, or down, depending. I'm 5'4". And I sure didn't feel like defending all that success before dawn. I tiptoed out the back door to my white car, ancient yet spotless, and headed for work. Syrup, I told Hugo, the busboy, must be poured slowly from the huge cans into the plastic pourers on the table, because if you pour it fast, you can't control the flow, and you get syrup everywhere, which never really cleans up. It leaves a sticky residue that comes back to haunt you. Syrup, I told him, is our enemy. But like Alan Feynman, Hugo was a male without vision. He couldn't anticipate disaster, couldn't cope with forethought and prevention. He let his life rule him rather than the other way around, which is why I personally filled the syrup containers on Sunday mornings. Maple, strawberry, boysenberry, and pecan. I had just filled the last containers and was putting them on the tables in horizontal rows. I lined up the juices and the coffee mugs for optimal efficiency, which some people who shall remain nameless would call perfectionism. But when the place gets busy, trust me, you want everything at your fingertips. Otherwise, you'll lose control. I never lose control. Hugo had set the back tables, and I followed him, straightening the glass silverware. You'd think that he'd been born in a barn. Andy Pappas, the cook, was making the special hash browns with onion and green pepper that people loved. I steeled myself for the hungry Sunday morning mob that would descend in two hours. I always mentally prepared for situations that I knew were going to be stressful. It helped me handle them right. I could see me, Cheryl, and Lucy, the other waitresses, serving the crowd, handling the cash register. Usually, Howard O'Halloran took the money, but he was taking a long-needed weekend off since his wife said if he didn't, she would sell the place out from under him. I could see myself watching my station like a hawk, keeping the coffee brewing, getting the pancakes delivered hot to the tables. Do it fast, do it right. That was my specialty. It was seven o'clock. Cheryl and Lucy were late, but I knew that Lucy's baby was sick and Cheryl was picking her up, so I didn't worry. They'd been late before. I myself was never late. I unlocked the front door and a few customers came straggling in with their Sunday newspapers settling in the boots. Nothing I couldn't handle. Things didn't start getting crazy until around 8.30. I had my system. I took orders and walked quickly to the kitchen window. Four over easy on eight with sausage, I said crisply, side of cakes. That was restaurant speak for four plates of two eggs over easy with sausage and pancakes on the side. Andy tossed his spatula in the air and went to work. The man had total focus. He could have had two dozen eggs cooking in front of them, and he knew when to flip each one. A young family came in with three small children, gave them the big table by the window, got them kid seats, and took their order. Number three, that was my waitress number. Andy called the number over the loudspeaker when my order was ready, and I went and picked it up. A nice time-efficient system. I walked quickly to the counter. Running made the customers nervous, grabbed the eggs, sausage, and pancakes, carried them four up on my left arm to table six, smiling professionally. Everything all right here, folks? Everybody nodded happily and dug in. Everything was always merry and pleasant at the ye old pancake house. That's why people came. Merry people left big tips. I checked the ye old clock on the wall, 747. Still, no Cheryl or Lucy. They'd never been this late. 
Alan Feynman had been more than one hour late plenty of times. Alan Feynman didn't care about time, his or anyone else's. I didn't understand the grave problems he had at first. I was so caught up in him, this cute, brainy, funny guy who really seemed to want a shot of discipline. I put my usual extra effort into the relationship, baked his favorite cookies, cappuccino chip, packed romantic picnics, French bread brie, and strawberries, thought about unusual things to do in cold water Michigan, which was quite a challenge, but I went to the library and came up with a list of 10 possible side trips around town that we could do for free. You're just so organized, he would say, which I thought was a true compliment. Later on, I realized, coming from him, it was the darkest insult. Andy was flipping pancakes on the grill. I scanned my customers to make sure everyone was cared for and turned to dash into the bathroom quickly when a screech of tires sounded in the parking lot. I looked out the window. A lump caught in my throat. A large tour bus pulled to a grinding halt. I watched in horror as an army of round, middle-aged women stepped from the bus and headed toward the restaurant like hungry lionesses stalking prey. It was natural selection. I was as good as dead. Number three. I looked at Andy, who raised his face to heaven. Call them, I shrieked. Call Cheryl and Lucy. Tell them to get here. Andy reached for the phone. I turned toward the front door as the tour bus woman poured in. They were all wearing sweatshirts that read, Michigan Woman for a Cleaner Environment. A table for 66, said a woman laughing. My lungs collapsed. 66 hungry environmentalists. I pointed to a stack of menus, remembering my personal waitress rule number one. Never let a customer know you're out of control. Sit anywhere, I cooed. I'll be right with you. If you wrote the menu on a blackboard, you wouldn't waste paper, one said. Number three, I raced back to the kitchen. Pancakes for table eight. I layered the plates on my left arm, plopped butter balls from the yield butter urn on the pancakes. Andy said he tried Cheryl and Lucy, and no one answered. At least they were on their way. I raced to table eight. The little girl took one look at her chocolate chip pancakes and burst into tears. They're not the little ones, she sobbed. Oh, now, precious, said her father. I'm sure this nice young lady doesn't want you to be disappointed. I looked at the hungry environmentalist who wanted coffee. Life is tough, kid. Tell the waitress what you want, precious. Precious looked at me, loving the control. She scrunched up her dimples, dabbed her tears, and said, I want the teeny weeny ones, please. Teeny weeny ones coming up, I chirped, and raced to Andy's. Chocolate silver dollars for the brat on eight, I snarled. Make them perfect or someone dies. You are very attractive when you get busy, Andy said, laughing. Shut up. Just then, the phone rang. I lunged for it. It was Lucy calling from the hospital. Her baby had a bronchial infection, needed medicine. She couldn't come in now, but Cheryl was on her way. She should be pulling onto the interstate now. Are you all right there, Jill? Of course, I lied. Take care of that baby. That's the most important thing. You're terrific, she said, and hung up. I am terrific, I told myself. I can handle this because as a terrific person, I have an organized system that always works. I grabbed two coffee pots, raced to the tour group, smiling. Always smile. Poured coffee. They'd only get water if they asked. We're so glad you came to see us this morning. Yes, we have many tours passed through. Usually we have more matrices, though. It's safe bet that any restaurant on this earth has more waitresses than the ye old pancake house does at this moment. I took their orders like a shotgunner shooting clay pigeons. Pool! Pigs in a blanket, steak and fried eggs, buttermilk pancakes, Betsy Ross buttermilk with strawberry and 
blueberry compote, colonial corn cakes, Alan Feynman's favorite. A round-faced woman looked at me, grinning. Everything looks so good, she sighed. What do you recommend? I recommend that you eat someplace else, ma'am, because I do not have time for this. I looked toward the front of the restaurant. Six large men were waiting to be seated. Hugo was pouring syrup everywhere and took pours to torture me, sloshing it everywhere. Everything's great here, ma'am. I'll give you a few seconds to decide. I turned to the woman in the next booth. The round-faced woman grabbed my arm. I don't like being touched by customers. Just a minute. Well, it all looks so good. Number three, I glared in Andy's direction. A cook can make or break you. The round-faced woman decided on the buttermilk pancakes, a daring choice. I ran to the kitchen window. Hit me, Andy said. I'd love to. You're only getting this once. Buttermilk's on twelve, pigs on four, Betsy's on three, colonials on seven. I threw the rest of the orders at him. You have very small handwriting, he said. That's often the sign of low self-esteem. I put my hand down in one of Hugo's syrup spills, pushed my bangs back with it, and I felt syrup soak my scalp. Andy said, You're only one person, Jill. I scanned the restaurant. Juice glasses askew, hungry people waiting at dirty tables. I could do anything if I worked hard enough. Sure would be here any minute. Waitress, we're out of syrup. A man held his empty syrup container up. I looked under the counter for the extra maple syrup containers I'd cleverly filled, started toward the man, tripped over an environmentalist foot, which sent the syrup container flying, caught midair but upside down by a trucker who watched dumbly as the syrup oozed onto the floor in a great sticky glop. I lunged for the syrup container, slid on the spill, felt sugared muck coat on my exposed flesh. Hugo, I screamed, pointing at the disaster. Hot water! Number three, I moved in a daze as more and more people came, got the tour bus groups fed and out. Had they mentioned separate checks, one woman asked. No. Made coffee, more coffee, told everyone I was the only waitress here, and if they were in a hurry, they might want to go someplace else. But no one left. They just kept coming, storming through the restaurant like Cossacks. People were grabbing my arm as I ran by. What's your name, babe? asked a lecherous man. Miss, I snarled. Number three, I had a life before I woke up this morning. Everything was in place. Buckwheat's on table three. The man looked at him. He said, you call these buckwheats? Buckwheats are supposed to be enormous and hearty. I'm the fall guy for everything that happens in the restaurant. It's my tip that's floating down the river waving goodbye. I embraced my personal waitress rule number two. The customer is always right, even if they're dead wrong. I said, that's the way we do them here, sir. And he said he can't eat them. He can't even look at them. He'll have to get the buttermilks, not knowing the trouble he's caused me. Andy gets sensitive if someone sends the food back. He's an artist, can't handle criticism. You have to lie to him or he slows down. I raced back to the kitchen. That man's degenerate, I said to Andy. He wouldn't know a world-class buckwheat if it jumped in his lap. He doesn't deserve to be in the presence of your cooking. The phone rang. I lunged for it. It's Cheryl calling from someone's car phone on the interstate with impossible news. A trailer truck had Jack and Fide, spilling soda cans everywhere. There was a five-mile backup. She'd be hours getting to work. Are you all right? Cheryl asked. I looked at the line of cars pulling into the parking lot, the tables bulging with hungry customers, the coffee cups raised in anticipation of being filled, the line at the cash register. I heard a woman say how the restaurant had gone downhill and the people were looking at me like I was their breakfast savior, like I had all the power and knowing, like I could single-handedly make sure they were happy and fed. And I was ashamed that I couldn't do it, but no one could, not even me. I tore off my ye old bonnet. I'm trapped in a pancake house, I shrieked in the phone, 
And like in all sci-fi stories, the connection went dead. Number three, I limped toward him, a shadow of my former self. We're out of sausage, Andy said solemnly. Good, it's one less thing to carry. I stood on the counter, put my head back and screamed, We're out of sausage and it's not my fault. A man at the back table hollered that he needed ketchup for his eggs. I reached down in the K section under the counter. Nothing under K. I got on my knees, hands shaking, riffling through jams, jellies, lingonberries. Hugo, I shrieked. He ran up to me. Ketchup, Hugo, wake up, the sky is falling. He pointed to the C section. Cats up, he said meekly. I was falling down a dark, disorderly tunnel. There was no end in sight. Coffee grounds were in my eyebrows. My hands smelt like used tea bags. I was exhausted, syrup encrusted. I'd had to go to the bathroom for the past three hours. People were going to go get their own coffee, the ultimate defeat for any waitress. I looked at my haggard reflection in the coffee urn. The only consolation was was that I wouldn't live till noon. Waitress! I raced down the aisle to table 12, seeing the hunted look in my customer's eyes. I wanted to be perfect for every one of you. I wanted you all to like me. I'm sorry, I'm not better, not faster. Please don't hate me. I'm only one person, not even a particularly tall person. I'm sorry I fell to table 8, but I simply can't do anything. I felt a ripple of crass laughter in the air. I turned. Alan Feynman had walked in with his parents. No. Anything but this. Our eyes met. I could hear the taunts at school. The never-ending retelling of this. My ultimate nightmare. Can I help, Jill? He rolled up his shirt sleeves. Alan Feynman was offering to help. I grabbed his arm. Can you work the register? Of course. Alan organized the people into a line, made change, smiled. He had such a nice smile, thanked everyone for their patience, got names on lists. Miss Feynman took off her jacket and asked, Can I make coffee, dear? Miss Feynman, you don't have to. We've always been so fond of you, Jill. I slapped a bag of decaf in her sainted hands. Mr. Feynman poured himself a cup of coffee and went back into the car. We whipped that place up into shape. All I needed was a little backup. My pockets were bulging with tips, and when Cheryl raced in at 11.45, I pushed a little girl aside who'd been waiting patiently by the bathroom door, and I lunged toward the toilet stall. Life is tough, kid. By 1.30, the crowds had cleared. Lucy had called. Her baby was home and doing better. Alan Feynman and I were sitting at the back table eating pancakes. He said he missed me. I said I missed him, too. Hugo was speed-pouring boysenberry syrup, spilling everywhere. But somehow, it didn't matter anymore. It was good enough, and that, I realized happily, was fine by me. The End